but we just, we want the audience to be able to hear you. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to put you on as 6A. And, and, okay. you're going to be, and you're working on it, James. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I, um, and we're, we have, oh, it's 9.30. Okay. It's 9.30. Good morning, everybody. The regular meeting of the Board of Directors of the Golden Rain Foundation of Laguna Woods of California, Nonprofit Mutual Benefit Corporation, this Tuesday, December 1st, 2020, 930, Laguna Woods, uh, will now call the meeting to order. So we have a quorum. I see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So we have a quorum, and um, so we will now have Director Garth Hoffner will lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. All right, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. So Grant, I didn't wait for you. We are on TV, correct? We are. Yes, we are on air. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, the next we would be acknowledging the media. The next order of business is the approval of the agenda including any adjustments to the consent calendar to be placed uh, under unfinished business. Are there any changes to the agenda? Madam Chair. Joan, Joan. I want to add uh, the VMS report for under 6A. VMS update. Okay. And um, I have some other uh, changes that we should make, right. and that would be to move uh, 10B to 11A. So 10B is uh, approve the resolution for Bank of America borrowing with updated list of officers. So that would be moved to 11A. And on 12D, um, I would like to add uh, that it, it basically says the code of conduct, and I want to add anti-harassment policy. So is, are there any other changes? I'll repeat that again. Under unfinished business, you've got approved the resolution of the bank. Right. 11B was harassment. That's 11. Yeah. And then 12D. 12D would be add anti-harassment policies because we will look at uh, two documents. Where did that come from? Well, uh, in the closed meeting, you'll see that, that uh, Lori presented the anti-harassment policy, so we'll be so reading you're it. it from, you're moving it from closed to open? No, it's we, we are establishing an advisory committee to okay. review those two documents. Thank you. Okay. Have you got it, Joe? I hope so. So, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes. Okay. Are there any other corrections? Then the agenda is approved as corrected. All right. So the next item in business would be the approval of the minutes of November 4th, 2020, regular open meeting. 
Are there any corrections? If there are no corrections, uh, the meeting, the minutes of November 4th are approved. And next would be the approval of the minutes for November 12th, 2020 organizational meeting. <clears throat> are there any corrections or deletions? If there are none, then the minutes are approved. So the next item uh, is uh, the report of the chair. And I have no report except that I want to wish everybody happy holidays in this very difficult time. Um, we haven't been, a I haven't, uh, and I think the rest of you have not been able to spend our time with family and friends that we normally do. Um, so um, basically just have a great holiday. Um, <clears throat> the next will be um, uh, 6A, okay, which would be James Tongue. Will you report uh, for VMS, please? Okay, I have just uh, very briefly. First, uh, I want I do want to uh, just uh, report very quickly in our open meeting. Uh, Betty Parker uh, presented a financial report. I like well, I just uh, highlight three points. First is uh, uh, she presented there's a 17 million dollars in revenue from all the income of a broadband facility room rental, uh, uh, you know, equity storing, you know, uh, by by rental horse, and four garden center, and the fifth guest fees and additional occupants. Second point is uh, the staff, you know, VMS staff has been reduced from a total of uh, 754 in 2012 to 723 in two, uh, to 2021. And third point is, uh, you know, based on the price index, it was, uh, was average is 3.6% in 2019 because of uh, COVID-19, you know, people closed up to uh, 1.72% for the first 10 months of this year. So that's uh, for the open meeting briefly uh, updates. And the second part, I just want to remind everyone, we, the VMS, already finalized and actually using anti-policy, uh, I mean, anti-harassment policy. And as also, you know, Bonnie already indicated that, that the, 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 all the board will form a working committee to continue working on on this anti-harassment policy. Hopefully, eventually, everyone have the same policy. So that's all I have. Uh, everybody have a, a happy holiday. Thank you. Thank you, James. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing that harassment policy. We have been working on it for a couple of years now, and and uh, and the collaboration, you know, so that we can have one policy is is yeah. something to, is a great goal. Let's put it that way. Okay. Yeah, so the next, please, I have a, one last thing. Uh, I okay. finally decided I'm going to re uh, rerun the uh, BMS uh, representative for GRF. So hopefully. GRF, you uh, you will vote for me. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, James, and I'm glad you're running. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay, so the next item. I don't understand. Uh, uh, the next item would be the CEO report. Jeff. Good. Good morning to the uh, board of directors and um, everybody watching. Uh, the request uh, under my CEO report today is to uh, give everybody a, a little bit more detailed update on COVID-19 uh, and um, what what is occurring right now and well, you know what what actions we, we've been taking. So I wanted to uh, put a little pout. We put a PowerPoint presentation for you today. I'm going to walk through that and then answer any questions that the the board may have with regards to um, COVID-19. So uh, go to the next slide, please. <clears throat> 
So um, what you see on the, um, the screen is a snapshot of if you go to Orange County Health um, Agency and their COVID-19 uh, website. On the screen um, yet. This is the uh, standard. Uh, um, Joan? Hold on, Jeff. It we isn't on the screen. There we go. There, it is. there we go. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. Um, so the uh, the first slide that you see here is um, the uh, snapshot of what you, if you go on the Orange County Health um, Care Agency's COVID-19 website, um, you'll find this information. Um, so I want to make sure people um, can do that. And, and certainly when we um, go on channel uh, TV6, we um, give all of the website information out there so you can find that on our website as well as long as well as uh, Orange County. Um, so what you see is yesterday's uh, data that was reported um, and the um, there are two significant things that I wanted to mention. So over the last couple of weeks um, and, and clearly through the month of November we have seen a spike in the numbers of cases going up and also the the rate of hospitalization has been going up and I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute but what you see here is um, 734 cases that were reported yesterday the day before that we were over a thousand and a couple of the days between Thanksgiving and the halt and the weekend um, we were over a thousand in numbers and so we're we're averaging close to that um, thousand dollar peak on, on a daily basis now for the last five, six days. Um, it was at 734 yesterday. Um, the very good news in the sense of no reported deaths over the last couple of days, so that's a um, positive um, note. The test reported, um, the 7,015, has also been up. Um, so as people were probably contemplating either getting together for the holiday weekend, um, Thanksgiving weekend, and just the uh, concerns that have been expressed out there by um, Orange County Health, uh, the state, and na nationwide, more testing is occurring. So obviously if you uh, test more, uh, the probability is you're gonna have a higher uh, positivity um, um, case rate. So that's showing up as well. Um, the Last one that I wanted to point out and probably the most important relative to um, operations wise is that the hospitalization rate of 605 and the ICU of 146. That has been a, um, again, a, a very much in the month of November, a climbing uh, number. And uh, the concern there obviously is that if there is a spike in COVID-19 cases, uh, because of Thanksgiving, um, we'll see that hospital impact on um, probably in two to three weeks. We aren't going to see it immediately. Um, so the healthcare um, throughout the state of California is concerned about the hospitalization and the ICUs because obviously when we get to a certain level, um, the care um, that they can provide um, statewide, countywide gets stretched thin because of healthcare workers, um, hospital workers, nurses, and all that with the amount of people that are in the hospital because just because of COVID-19. Um, to um, go to the next page. Uh, so this is the next slide uh, that is um, the slide that is the focus on where we stand with regards to the category that we are in. Um, a few weeks ago, we were in the red category, which is the tier two category that you see um, in the um, box there on the left-hand side. It's, I know it's kind of small, but we were in the red tier, and we were actually, um, in, in the month of October, we were headed um, towards the moderate tier. And then we made a U-turn and headed back towards the purple category. Um, when you look at the number above, the adjusted daily case rate of 100,000, which is now at 18.7, um, we were down below six um, cases per 100,000 um, less than um, two months ago. And so the, um, the change has been pretty, pretty dramatic with regards to the amount of cases per 100,000 population. The positivity rate at 7.6, going back um, to the 7th of November that I'm referencing, uh, we were at 3.6. 
So we've gone up 4% with regards to positivity rate um, testing. The third category there, the 5.5, um, is uh, interestingly enough, the, the number of the quartile positivity rate basically takes all of the um, service areas in Orange County using zip codes and census tracts and basically says this is your high um, exposure rate and you need to, as a county, make sure that you don't have pockets that are having high exposure rates while the rest of the county is doing really well. You need to, to address all of those in order to move up and down in the categories of widespread, substantial, and moderate. That number is actually um, not moved very much. So uh, I guess um, kind of the, the good news, bad news is that the high point or the hot spots in the county haven't changed much, but the rest of the county unfortunately is, is um, becoming um, more active with regards to um, cases um, occurring on a daily basis. Next slide, please. Again, this slide shows you um, two important things here. The hospital uh, um, patients, the 605 and the 146 that I mentioned. But really what's important um, is the factor of on the right-hand side that we now have um, ICU beds currently available is at 26% and that's dropping. Um, and the current um, ventilators available is 62%. That actually has stayed pretty consistent. So that's good news on that note. But the available beds um, continue to drop. We were up in the high 30s or 30% earlier um, this month. And then you can see the change in the three-day average hospitalization patients, that's 17% um, growth. And then the chart below really just uh, diagrams it for for people to see how um, earlier we were doing pretty well at the beginning of November and how we've seen a um, big jump up in the hospitalization rate um, going down to the end of November and into December 1st. The next slide, please. So um, background, um, in response to ongoing public health threats, um, uh, the COVID-19 disease outbreaks, and these are some of the timelines that I wanted to provide to you. So in June 2020, temporary COVID-19 rules adopted on an emergency basis. Um, that was in the village here. And then in 2020, um, in July, mod we modified temporary COVID-19 rules were adopted on an emergency basis. And that was basically because at that point in time, July was the um, highest spiked uh, month um, in, in not only in the village, but in Orange County with regards to COVID numbers. Unfortunately, um, the end of November and December were, were creeping up on those same kind of numbers. Then August in August 2020, the resolution pertaining to the adoption of a modified uh, COVID-19, um, there should be 19, not 20, uh, 10 there, um, COVID-19 um, rules were ratified. And then that was on a... Um, Temporary basis, the uh, emergency resolution only has a, a specific lifespan, and that emergency resolution expired on uh, October 26, 2020. The significance of um, the expiration of that was under that resolution, it was mandatory um, requirement that people wear a mask whenever they leave and go out into public spaces. Um, that that um, requirement, and along with the potential of being cited and um, giving a warning and then citation, citation if um, it were to continue to happen by individuals not wearing masks, um, those two elements have um, discontinued due to the fact that the um, modified temporary rules expired. We are now following um, specifically the guidelines from the state of California and Orange County Health with regards to the requirements of masks, which um, is is that it, um, you have to be wearing a mask outside unless you can social distance. Um, and that that's probably the biggest change relative to that. We're not going through um, a citation process. However, if we are seeing individuals out there that are not socially distancing and um, are not following the state guidelines and the uh, guidelines of the Orange County Health, we are notifying them 
um, and we are talking to them via our security department, make sure they're aware of that. Um, if it becomes a situation where um, it is problematic with regards to uh, whether it's a congregation of people or people are just um, not following the rules, then we, um, we could um, potentially notify the Orange County Sheriff. The Orange County Sheriff has um, indicated though that they do, want, do not want to get into the face mask um, um, uh, policing. Um, so even though that the, the state law is there and Orange County um, is following that law, um, the Orange County Sheriff said that they were not going to be enforcing um, the mask wearing um, operation out there at this point in time. The, the other thing I wanted to mention, um, going back to just some data real quick, was um, back in um, no, early November and, and back in October, that um, just going back two months on uh, October the 2nd, um, which is, you know, two, like I said, two months ago, we were at in Laguna Woods. And, that, and I, again, for the residents, I want to make sure everybody understands, when we, we get data information for the city of Laguna Woods, which we are certainly a very high percentage of that, but we do have some facilities outside of our gates that are part of Laguna Woods. In, um, on October 2nd, we had 67 cases in uh, Laguna Woods and five deaths. We are now over 104 cases two months later and we're at 10 deaths. So we have doubled the deaths and um, not 100%, but a, but a very big jump from 67 to 104 uh, number of cases in the city of Laguna Woods um, just in the last two months. So um, that is um, a very, very um, large jump um, and something that we need to be um, recognized and continue to push the theory that um, people need to be very careful out there, wear their mask, social distance, and wash their hands a lot um, and to keep safe out there. Um, but that, that, those numbers also are reflected nationwide and statewide, um, which you probably have read or heard about in the state news. I'm gonna go on to number six, page six in the presentation. So this is the current status. The village is adhering to, as I indicated, the state of California Department of Public Health, um, which is CDPH county and other applicable public health guidelines relating to the component of emergency resolutions. Again, face coverings, recreation sponsored events, outdoor gatherings and activities, indoor gatherings and activities, and limited stay at home order. These are all the um, parameters that the state has provided to us, and these are the ones that we are currently following. Next page. So with regards to face coverings, people in California are required to wear face coverings when in high risk situations, any indoor public space, when waiting in lines um, anywhere, whether it's at a shopping thing or waiting in line for a service um, or uh, transportation, when uh, getting healthcare, obviously going to any kind of medical facility, on public transportation, paratransit, or when um, ride sharing. And that includes anything in the village with regards to our transportation program. At work, um, when near others or moving through common areas. So the requirement here at um, our facility is that individuals that work here are wearing their mask. Um, and if they're moving around, that they have to wear their mask. And that same um, recommendation goes for all of our employees out there in the field and all our field service employees and security employees as well. So that's everybody, our, um, including our gate ambassadors. Um, outdoors, if a six foot distance um, from others is not possible, uh, then the requirement under the state law and Orange County, following Orange County guidelines is that you must be wearing a mask if you cannot social distance. Employees and BMS contractors must wear face coverings at, um, during their operation, especially as I indicated. If they're in an office, um, closed office environment, they, they um, where they're um, protector or not engaging with anybody else, then they can take that mask off. But if they're in, um, in engaging in an open area or walking down the halls or anything like that. Uh, same way with contractors out there. And we have that posted at our gate um, so that people understand that that's a requirement coming into the facility. Next page. <clears throat> uh, 
recreation sponsored events, um, adhering to uh, COVID-19 industry guidelines and, st and the guidance for activities such as outdoor recreation, uh, fitness centers, uh, drive-in movies and entertainment. Um, this is again, um, based on the information that we get handed down by the state, based on mandatory requirements for face covering, social distancing and hand hygiene and more still obviously in place with regards to all of these activities. Next page. Following recently released uh, CDPH guidelines for outdoor gatherings and activities, um, purple tier mandates. So now that we've gone into the purple tier, all gatherings must be held outside. So there's no indoor activities. Gatherings that include more than three households are prohibited. Keep household interactions uh, um, stable over time to reduce the transmission. That's obviously guidance. Gatherings of no more than three households permitted in public park or outdoor spaces and do not attend gatherings of sick or high risk groups. And that's a, um, again, a guidance and recommendation. Um, on to the next one, the clubhouses and indoor activities. At this time, all gatherings must be held outside in the purple tier and indoor activities remain closed. Um, VMS continually monitors um, the state and county and other applicable health guidelines and guidances and pertaining to clubhouse and indoor activities. And right in the next page um, mentions the limited stay at home order, non-essential work and social gatherings are prohibited between 10 p.m. and 5 a.m. This is um, in the purple tier counties and this went into place a couple of weeks ago. Um, in effect from 10 p.m. November 21st to 5 a.m. Uh, December 21st, 2020. Do want to indicate that the governor has um, indicated in a press um, conference yesterday that if the numbers continue, that there is possibility that the stay at home order will expand. Um, if that's possible, that stay at, home, stay at home order may be reflective of what we saw back in March, um, which would mean um, our operations would be impacted because we would be sending people home that are not essential employees. Um, so we are looking at that and monitoring that closely. The um, last couple things I wanted to mention was that um, we've been in contact with regards to uh, the vaccine. So as you know, you've probably um, heard on TV that there um, in the news that there are a couple of vaccines that are going through their um, trying to get their emergency authorization for implementation in um, uh, later this month um, to try to get the vaccine out there. Um, that's very good news, obviously. The sooner we can get a vaccine out there, the better, um, from my perspective, obviously. The, um, the vaccine process is, um, and how it gets distributed is, is being handled in two manners. One, um, the uh, ultimate guidelines for the distribution of the vaccine will be handled and is being handled by CDC, um, the Disease Control Center. Uh, they are the ones that have promulgated the original um, distribution uh, guidelines with regards to the vaccine, who gets it first, what are the priorities. They have then passed those down to the state of California and um, now to the state of California down to Orange County. The County of Orange has formed a COVID-19 task force. Um, if you are interested in um, finding out additional information about that task force, again, you go to the Orange County um, Healthcare Agency's website where you get the COVID-19 in their search engine. You can just put in task force and it'll come up. Uh, this task force is made up of um, a number of uh, people in the medical field, uh, uh, senior organizations, um, police and fire, uh, first responders, um, all of such with regards to how um, the vaccine will get dis distributed within the um, County of Orange. We have been in contact with the task force uh, to make sure that um, two things. One, they're well aware of um, Laguna Woods and the fact that um, we are 55 older community, but in fact, um, most of the people that live here are over 65, which puts us in that category of highest risk with regards to age population. And as such, um, we wanted to make sure that they're well aware of 
um, us and could we be in line for potentially uh, seeing the vaccine come to Laguna Woods as soon as possible. So um, they have received that um, report um, from us. We also talked to um, one of the PIOs that's involved with that um, and she reaffirmed that um, they're well aware of Laguna Woods and, and our scenario here, um, as well as Seal Beach, um, both in Orange County. Um, those two facilities are similar in nature uh, with the population. So we're right there at the top of the list along with nursing home facilities and assisted uh, care facilities. The um, CDC guidelines um, are clear in that, uh, that 65 and over risk category would be what I'll call 1A and 1B. We would be in the 1B category for um, the receiving the, potentially receiving the vaccine. The 1A category is all of the first responders, um, public safety, fire, police, and then hospital, um, nurses, um, doctors, anybody working at um, the hospital um, structure, um, doctor's offices that would be um, impacting uh, the treatment for people that have COVID-19. So they're, they're the number one category, then uh, the senior at risk category is number two before the general public, um, which would be the third category going down. So um, we also had um, correspondence yesterday, um, didn't get to talk to them directly, but they did send me a follow-up email from our um, Congresswoman's office and they are um, trying to get me coordinated with um, somebody from the state of California. Uh, again, trying to put the emphasis on, hey, if the vaccine's ready to go, how do we get it here to the village to those that um, want to get the shot? And how could we help facilitate um, the implementation of that? So um, we're moving forward on that. Um, and I'll be able to certainly uh, keep the boards up, up to speed as soon as I have any additional information on that. And that concludes my um, uh, report on COVID-19. Uh, and I certainly, if there are questions by board members, I can look at the chat and or look at hands being raised and however you want to go, Bunny, on that, it would be up to you. Okay. Yeah. Um, Lance? Thank you. Hi, Jeff. Nice to see you. Um, I have a request. I don't think I'm alone on this. We have 105 cases in Laguna Woods, and I'm just looking at the report from the Orange County Health Agency of the current status of where we are at 105 cases. Um, in comparison to previous years, at this time of year, um, they're claiming that 10 of those cases are COVID-related and uh, the others are not. I'm not sure because we're in a higher risk community at large, the number of people who normally, under the normal set of circumstances, would pass away compared to the conditions under COVID. One of the things I would like to know, because of the reports that you've given us, the data being in the Orange County Health Care Agency, 15,153 cases are reported right now just in the city of Santa Ana. But we're looking at our surrounding area, the cities that we're affected by. I'm looking at, um, for instance, Elisa Viejo at 622 cases. Uh, Irvine at 2,732 cases, Laguna Niguel at 709. We probably would be more um, efficient and active for the residents to let them know the impact of our immediate area that it facilitates the hospitals and where are our hospitals serving our community in terms of their capacity. I think we need to add that to information to our residents. It's more applicable. Question, can you have that? happen? Can you give us a report on that? Sure. The, um, we can add that to any report. Um, we can take a geographic five mile radius or 10 mile radius, however we would like to um, look at that. And, and I can report on the cities that are in that ra radius. And that's going back to your point, the, when you look at that, um, um, that one page where it was talking about uh, the 5.5, which is really the looking at the hotspots of, of Orange County, because what we clearly saw was the hotspots for a long period of time were in Santa Ana and Anaheim and, and Westminster. And, and that's really due, um, in all probability, due to the fact that the density is just much higher in those neighborhoods. Um, and so the higher the density, the propensity to be higher in the COVID cases, unfortunately. 
um, and, and certainly South Orange County, except for what's really interesting, they, and they, I don't, they don't have an explanation. They had, they had a couple of hot spots in San Clemente and in San Juan Capistrano, and they're not high density populated areas either, but, um, but because of what um, Lynn, you are referencing, is we have a, we have a lower uh, density, therefore we have had a history of a lower case, case load, positive case load. The, the reason I'm asking for it is we really probably need to let the residents know what the hospitals are suffering and what the uh, likelihood of a resident being able to get treatment if, uh, if they should contract the disease. That's, that's probably what people want to know. Do they have the capacity in our immediate area? The, um, and I'll be able to give an additional report. I do know that when we were in July, um, I'll use that just as an anecdotal, that the, the hospitals actually will take patients from other parts of the county, though, when the hospitals get impacted. So they spread, um, unfortunately, I'll call it spread the wealth around. It's not, it's not just isolated to, um, so they're handling COVID cases on a, a basis of the hospitalizations. They have the capability of handling at Anaheim and Santa Ana, um, Hogue Hospital, for instance, um, in, in, down in um, Newport those are getting cases. In fact, one of the things that we found out was that they were actually bringing cases in from Imperial County um, because Imperial County didn't have enough hospital. So um, I'll have to see if they can break that out for me a little bit so that we have an understanding of how many beds are capable of being able to handle and what their capacity is at this point in time. But I'll get that update. Yeah, I just think we need to know what their capacity is for our immediate area. Thank you very much. Okay, Bert. I think uh, another thing is we, we, sh we should not lose awareness of the fact that this is a flu season. And flu is also a killer. Uh, and I think it's important for people to recognize that wearing masks can also make a big difference in terms of um, getting the flu. Uh, there were statistics that were shown for the past five years in the south, south of southern continents uh, that showed that flu was almost eradicated this past year uh, relative to the past five years due to the fact that people were wearing masks. And so wearing masks is something that perhaps we might consider uh, going beyond just COVID uh, during the flu season. Thank you. Okay, uh, the comment that I want to make, and then I'll, I'll get to you, Lynn, was uh, recreation. Okay, uh, Jeff, I know there were some recreation events planned and there was the golf cart parade planned. So my question is, so the audience knows, are these things going to be canceled at this point in time? So with regards to um, the good question, um, Bunny, regarding the golf cart parade at this point in time, that still is on. Um, with regards to other activities, we have um, um, communicated with um, Lori, and I think today, as part of the closed session report, because um, I haven't I haven't actually seen anything from Lori um, this morning, uh, she was going to give a, um, um, an update to me with regards to uh, what she was seeing with regards to the state uh, mandates and our issue of gatherings, um, whether. We were under the guidelines of gatherings in public places, private places. Um, it's getting more um, concentrated that gatherings, outside gatherings even are prohibited. So we are trying to get clarification from, and get an interpretation from her as well as what we have from the state to make sure we're all on the same page. So right now, the only thing I can tell you is the um, parade is still on, but additional activities uh, gatherings such as our concerts and stuff like that may be put on hold. Okay, thank you. Uh, Lynn, you have another question? Uh, one more, uh, Jeff. How about um, giving the residents the uh, information about uh, wearing masks? Because we're finding, um, at least I am, some of the people in the neighborhood are wearing the same mask day after day after day. And I've discussed this with my own physician. I think we need to put a policy together advising them the frequency of changing their masks 
on a daily basis for, for their own protection, we're not really feeding them that information so they understand you can't use the same one day after day. I was just wondering if you would address that. It's a uh, very good point, Lynn. Um, so, um, you know, to anybody listening, obviously, there are, there are specific guidelines with regards to, you know, washing cloths, masks, not wearing them over and over and over, as you indicated, um, or the disposable ones. Um, we have um, been pretty consistent with regards to getting in our email blast that goes out on Friday updates with regards to the mask wearing and, and guidelines. So we'll continue to do that and, and get that out to an email blast to our community. And on TV6, certainly I talk about it on Mondays and Fridays. So we'll continue to do that and um, provide that information to the, to the public here. Thank you. Madam Chair. I don't. You might also put it in the globe. Maybe we need a a, a box in the globe because a lot of people do read that. Just consider. Thank you. It's a good suggestion. And possibly the blast also, the blast and the globe. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It is in the blast. It is already. Okay, great. Any other questions? No more questions, Jeff. Yeah, I, 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 I'm a parent. <laughs> okay, get your words together, buddy. Um, uh, if you're if you're finished, is Siobhan going to report on anything? I think Siobhan's got some more information. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Honorable President, members of the board, I just have a few updates for you this morning. I wanted to remind everyone that the next bulky item pickup is Saturday, December 19th. If you have some bulky items disposed of before the holidays, this would be a good opportunity for you. If you do want to participate on December 19th, place your bulky items near your trash enclosure or in the same location you place your trash bins. Items can be set out the night before or no later than 7 a.m. on collection day. Please notify resident services prior to setting out your bulky items. And you can call resident services at 949-597-4600. As Jeff mentioned, the holiday golf cart parade is still on and it's scheduled to take place this Saturday, December 5th at 2 p.m. in the Clubhouse One parking lot. Recreation and special events invites residents to bedeck their golf carts in holiday splendor, participate in a parade throughout the village to spread cheer. And resident spectators are encouraged to deck their homes, lawns, windows, and balconies in seasonal spirit. Spectators will be treated to a parade featuring servicemen and women, Santa, and additional entertainment. Golf cart parade participants may register now through Friday on ActiveNet or by calling recreation at 949-597-4273. The Transportation Department wants to share its holiday schedule with riders in advance so they can plan accordingly. On Christmas Eve, there will be no fixed route service. Plan a ride, however, will be available to all residents between the hours of 8 a.m. and 4 p.m. And residents should call transportation at 949-597-4659 to make Christmas Eve reservations. On New Year's Eve, regular bus service will take place and on Christmas Day and New Year's Day, there will be no transportation services. Our village golf operations are excited to announce that in 2020, to better serve community golfers, tee time reservations will be made online. New software will replace current phone reservation system. This will decrease time that players spend scheduling reservations and make our golf operations more efficient. In coming weeks, watch for future emails with specific instructions and a link to the new online system. And lastly, I want to provide an update on the 2020 census. The City of Laguna Woods had a self-response rate of 81.6%. This compares to the 67% national self-response rate and the 69% state self-response rate. These figures do not include responses provided directly to census workers. So the city's self-response rate will go up from the 81.6%. So that's a great participation rate. The Census Bureau is required by statute to provide information 
on the accounts to the president no later than December 31st. The recent update indicates the Bureau is working hard to make that deadline. And the city of Laguna Woods advises us they do not expect to receive local numbers until sometime in 2021. But again, want to thank all of our residents for participating in this critical endeavor. And that concludes my update this morning. Thank you. And that is the conclusion of the, uh, okay, Bert, you have a question. You got it. Sorry. It has been well known in the community that we've had computer difficulties uh, that has presented quite hardship. Um, and I understand that uh, we're in the process of restoring our, our data files now. And I'm just wondering if Jeff could provide a report as to where we stand today and when we expect to be back to normal operation. Bert, we have it on our uh, closed session agenda to give you a report with regards to if Why closed when public already is aware of the fact that we've had these difficulties? Well, the, it has to, the close has to do with some, some additional information with regards to the activity, but I can give you a brief um, for the public's benefit um, where we're at, uh, if, if, if it's okay with Bunny. Um, okay, um, so as, as you know, um, we have uh, um, recovered all of the uh, data at this point in time. And as the recovery of the data is back into our hands, we, um, and it never really left, but it, it, we got it unencrypted, let's put it that way. Uh, once that unencryption occurred, then we have gone through the process of bringing back all of our servers and our PCs um, back online so that we can facilitate that data going back into the hands of the departments that, that need it and use it. Uh, that process has been very, very um, um, tedious and because we needed to basically scrub um, all of our PCs and, and, and wipe them clean, wipe our servers clean to make sure that there wasn't any additional malware out there that we might run into. So that process is ongoing. So once the um, basic data was there to then um, transfer back into the departments, we have been doing that on an incremental base to get um, stellar and our key um, factors that are, are operationally critical um, back into um, full operations. We're not there yet. Um, we certainly are, have made a lot of progress, um, but what we have done is transported a certain amount of data so far that because we, again, need to scrub all that data, so we, we, we decided to take it kind of in, in level. So first, we've gone back like five years to take the last five years worth of data and bring that forward so that we can we can use that because that's critical with regards to, as you know, MNC and the operations there um, and with regards to alterations, with regards to security, making sure that we have the, the data for uh, compliance and doing all the reports that are necessary to put together. So we're, we're back on our feet um, and we're certainly progressing in that way. Um, but there are some additional um, steps that we need to take, and that will be part of that closed session report that I will provide to you. The um, timeframes, I don't have those right in front of me. I will be talking about timeframes, and Chuck will be joining us in that closed session um, to give you a, a little bit more detail. But um, bottom line is uh, the encryption um, is um, completed. We have the data, um, and now it's a matter of getting the data cleaned up back into our system and get it operational for everything that we can um, provide to our residents out there. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any, mother, any other questions? So if there's no more questions, the next order of business will be the open forum. And at this time, members may only may address the board of directors regarding items not on the agenda and within the jurisdiction of the board of directors. So do we have any um, uh, open forum speakers? Uh, good morning, President Carpenter, esteemed members of the board. We have two member comments today. Uh, the first one is from Lynn Hodge, Hodgman at 5460A as an apple. 
she states, numbers are rising. We are in the purple tier. Please listen to science and infectious disease experts. Number one, no indoor group spaces should be open. Do not ask supervisors to take the risk that will end up with more illness among us. Number two, masks should be enforced. I am unable to take a walk without dodging the unmasked or improperly masked about 50%. It provokes anxiety and I refuse to endanger myself by walking into the street. Number three, the Orange County says there should be no gatherings of people at risk, none. Because of our age, that means nearly all of us, no dancing, unmasked in parking lots, no groups at concerts, no unmasked sign, uh, singing. Please, you have the authority to help us all be safe. Please use it. Thank you. Second member comment is from Bethany Gilboard at 23912 E as in Edward. Uh, hello, my name is Bethany Gilboard and I reside at 23912 E. I received the Laguna Woods Globe and I'm confused and concerned regarding a front page article in today's paper. That would be November 19th of 2020. It's headed by the third mutual meeting. City sees jump in cases as state trips in virus fight. I find the article to be contradictory in nature as it refers to the surge in positive coronavirus cases. Then says we're lifting our mask enforcement rule of wearing masks outside in Laguna Woods Village. I'm appealing to your upcoming agenda since the last resolution of wearing masks when outside has expired. Your upcoming meeting on whether or not you pass a new resolution to enforce wearing masks when outside is crucial. I'm citing my concerns for the health and well-being of all residents and the staff of Laguna Woods Village especially since we're in a surge of cases and cases are increasing every couple of days. Now right here in Laguna Woods, we know that masks help slow the spread so it makes good sense to require them. We know residents will be having guests all around the Thanksgiving weekend, if not only for big holiday together. Please do the right thing for all of us here at a high age risk. Please pass the resolution to enforce wearing masks when outside. Actually, I think the county has issued a mandate to wear masks when outside since we landed back in the purple tier. Thank you for your thoughtful attention to this urgent matter. Sincerely, Bethany Gilbert. That is all for her. Thank you. Uh, would anyone like to respond to that? No one would like to respond to it. Um, the only thing I can say and I continually to say the staff is doing an excellent job as far as um, opening, closing our facilities, limiting gatherings uh, based upon the tiers, you know, that, that are presented based upon the information that's presented. Um, myself, uh, everywhere I go, people are wearing masks. Uh, if I go outside the gate, people are wearing masks. I go in the store, they're wearing masks. So um, I just uh, have to ask those people that don't wear their masks that they may rethink the situation and um, make sure that we're protecting ourselves and others as we go forward. Okay, so um, the next item on the agenda would be the uh, consent calendar, <coughs> excuse me. All matters listed under the consent calendar are recommended by action by committees and will be enacted by the board by one motion. So in the event an item is removed from consent calendar by members of the board, such items shall be subject to further discussion and action by the board. So we have the recommendation from the finance committee which is uh, consistent with, this, with its uh, statutory obligations, a subcommittee of the board consisting of the treasurer and at least one other board member reviewed and approved preliminary Golden Rain Foundation financials for the month of October 2020. And by this vote, ratify that such review be confirmed in this month's board open session meeting minutes. Okay, are there any objections? Okay. 
there's a, okay uh lynn I was not uh, on the board. I'd like to abstain from this one personally because I don't know anything about it. So um, I hope that's okay from voting. That's fine. Okay. But if there are no objections, okay, the consent calendar is approved. So the next item of unfinished business will be uh, the approval of the resolution for Bank of America borrowing with updated list of officers. Uh, Director Milliman, will you please read the resolution? Yeah. Want to hear it? Joan? Joan? Okay. Yes, I'm okay. here. Okay, got it. Resolution 1920XX. Whereas the Golden Rain Foundation maintains a letter of credit with the Bank of America in an amount sufficient to meet the lateral requirements for the workers' compensation insurance policy. And whereas on November 4th, 2020, the board authorized an increase in the letter of credit by $370,000 to meet national safety, national collateral requirements for renewal of the workers' compensation policy. And whereas the underlying borrowing resolution with Bank of America requires periodic updates when board officers change. Resolve then that on December 1st, 2020, the board ratifies the borrowing resolution attached with updated officer signatures. Resolved further that the officers and agents of this corporation are hereby authorized on behalf of the corporation to carry out this resolution. I move we accept this resolution. Do we have a second? Bert. Bert, second, thank you. Is there any discussion? No discussion, all those in favor? Okay. Yes. Yes, those hands. We have one, two, three, four, five, John, we can't six, see you. seven, eight. Yeah. Uh, so we have eight. Responses in the box when I can't get the camera on. Oh, okay. Box. Thank you. Okay, great. All right. So the motion passes. Um, and the next item in business is new business. And um, we will entertain a motion to approve the destination shopping fee of ten dollars. Uh, Joan, uh, will you yes. read the resolution? All right. <clears throat> resolution ninety twenty double X. Board resolution regarding the adoption of destination shopping fee. Whereas the transportation division offers a destination shopping excursion program for residents that began in May 2017. And whereas the destination shopping program has provided trips to local shopping centers two or three times per month at no cost with residents signing up by lottery drawing. And whereas on October 7th, 2020, the Mobility and Vehicle Committee recommended the Board of Directors approve a user fee of $10 to help offset operating costs. Now, therefore, be it resolved December 2nd, 2020, that the Board of Directors hereby approves a $10 per user fee to participate in the program. Whereas the rules shall be hereby adopted pursuant to this resolution and shall be deemed an effective governing document and effective operating rules for GRF. Resolve further that this resolution shall be in effect when the destination shopping program is reinstated in 2021. And resolve further that all the officers and agents of this corporation are hereby authorized on behalf of the corporation to carry out the purpose of this resolution. I move we accept this resolution. 
Do we have a second? second? We have a Don, second? Don Tibbet second. Uh, Madam Chair, I need to speak. Okay. Speak, Joan. I move we amend this resolution to delete the paragraph that begins under now, therefore, the one that starts, whereas the rules shall be adopted pursuant and so on. That whole paragraph is actually a repeat of the last paragraph. The last paragraph is standard and says everybody's going to comply. This one says the same thing. I move we, we amend it to take that paragraph out, the whereas. Okay, it's only the second whereas. The rules shall hereby adopted pursuant to resolution. Yes, Is that the way? Yes, yes. And I need a second. Okay. Do we have a second? Yvonne seconds. Yvonne? Okay. All right. Uh, is there any other discussion? All those in favor of the amendment? of the amended resolution. No, you have to vote on the amendment, sorry. Point of order, Madam Chair. Okay. We have to vote on the amendment to take this out, just whether or not you agree to do that. Okay, so all those in favor of uh, the amendment. Okay, so, so, um, the amendment passes, so now I have to vote on the original, is that correct? On the amended original. Yes, okay. So all those in favor of the amended original. Okay, thank you, the motion passes. So my question to Chris, when do we think we will be able to start up this um, program again? That'll depend on uh, the state requirements as Jeff went over with the COVID-19, whatever it's deemed uh, uh, safe for the community based on those California regulations, we'll make that call at that time. Okay, thank you. So we're actually looking till next year sometime, maybe even March, you know, we're, we'll be able to take advantage of it. And I understand it's a very popular program. So we do. So just to clarify, we have three shopping uh, trips a month, or is it more than that? Because I remember that they're reading something about there are different times that are also uh, available to people. But yeah, is it, it a total three? Yep, yeah, President Carpenter, in the, uh, in the past pre-COVID, uh, we ran this program anywhere three to four times a month, typically on Wednesdays, I believe it was. And due to the popularity, we actually had two different uh, routes going, one at 10 o'clock and one at 11 o'clock. So yes, it was a uh, very popular program and we're looking forward to bringing it back uh, once these COVID restrictions end. Okay, thank you. So the next order of business would be to entertain, entertain a motion and to approve a resolution to update the GRF committee appointment. Joan? Will you read the resolution? Yes. Resolution 90-20-XX GRF committee appointments resolved December 1st, 2020 that the following persons are hereby appointed and ratified to serve on the committees of this corporation. And rather than read every single committee, I'll call your attention to the fact we have one new committee, the Energy Solutions Ad Hoc Committee, which has been added. and. A, I trust that all the chairs have read their committees and that they're okay with it. So once I make the motion to approve this, you can update it if you need to. So. I have a comment, but I, I don't uh, know if I should okay. raise it now or later. Wait Please? till, wait till. Okay. I, I move we approve the committees as stated in this, uh, on this, in this resolution. And okay, do we have a second? Is there a second? Okay, Bert, Bert second. second. Okay, discussion. All right, Sue. Uh, my name is Smith Bell. I just need to correct the spelling of my name. I'm page three. Page three. 
where uh, Sue? Yep. It's yeah, spelled correctly elsewhere, but on page three, oh, you get a point. I apologize. I'm sorry, where is it? Under which committee, Sue? The energy, energy solution. The one you just mentioned, the energy committee. The energy committee. How should it be? PH, uh, just as it is elsewhere. I'm also uh, chair mm -hmm. on the first page. This is planning I'm committee. Really I'm, right. I'm the first name on the document. But then on page three, it's spelled with a B. And that's the correct spelling. Right. Are there any other corrections? So if there's no other uh, corrections, are all those in favor of approving the corrected resolution? <laughs> okay. I have hands. So one, two, three, four, five, six. six seven, and John says yes. So, <laughs> so the motion passes. Thank you so much. All right. So the next item is to approve the formation of the Energy Solutions Ad Hoc Committee and the mission statement. So do I hear a motion? I would like a motion to approve. I'll move. Okay, thank you. A second? Do we have a second? And Bert? A second. Any I'm sorry, who moved? Director Stevens. Uh, Sue. Sue. And Sue. Okay, thank you. And then Bert seconded it. Okay, is there any discussion? Yes. Yes, I, I have a question. Okay. okay. Joan? How long is this committee in effect? Um, I think uh, Sue can speak to that, but I don't know, you know, what the timeline would be exactly because That's of the fact that they're going to be doing a lot of research and then presenting the research uh, to staff. So, so I'm picturing that this could go on, you know, for a year, two years. I don't know. Okay, just, just on, ongoing research then. We need to, that's all I was. Right. Okay, thank you. Okay, Lynn? I have a question. Could we actually have the mission statement from this committee as we're trying to form it? What is it exactly their on mission? On the next page. There. Yes, yeah, the, the mission. The mission state is on is a 12C, page two of two. I have a comment, Bonnie, when you have sex. Okay. Uh, uh, Lynn? So why don't you go on? Okay, Lynn? I'm here. I'm here. So I'm looking at the um, staff report. Is that where I'm looking? I'm so sorry. Yes, the no, staff report, have... the next page. And it's, right met... the, it's right before oh, the financial. Well, I, have I have it now. Okay, got it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, John? Thank you. Um, I just want to comment before we vote on this thing that there is just endless discussion about energy-related issues going amongst our board, and I see it as directly and essentially related to the Strategic Planning Committee. Um, the Strategic Planning Committee has asked on multiple occasions to get some priorities with projected financial impact. and have never even been responded to, much less been provided that information. So if this committee is approved, I would just ask that that be made the highest priority that rather than, you know, because I've looked carefully at our financial statements and if we eliminate all our energy costs, it doesn't even rival what we spent on an insurance increase this year. So I think there's other reasons to have energy discussions. There's laws and efficiencies and safety and I'm an absolute supporter of it, but if we're gonna have a strategic planning committee that's gonna be effective, we need to coordinate those data and information to make sure we have it prioritized properly. And I just feel like we're off to a bad start on it. So I'd like to at least put that in front of our board that we get that information quickly if this committee is started. Thanks. Okay, Bert. Bert. 
Bert. <laughs> can't hear. Can't Unmute, hear you. Bert. Unmute, Bert. <laughs> Unmute it. There okay. you go. There we Would go. Would you ask uh, to see if we could do this without any expenditure at all, John? Uh, we are looking into a program that is now available to, from a number of the uh, larger the vendors uh, called EAAS, which stands for Energy as a Service, in which case uh, you contract with a uh, contractor who will actually do the study, feasibility study, design, uh, installation, operation, maintenance uh, of your equipment uh, that basically addresses your energy needs and in return, you pay them on the basis of kilowatt hours with an assurance that the cost of these kilowatt hours would be less than what you're paying your current utility rates. Okay, well, I, I appreciate that information. I assume that would all come out of a, of a meeting, but obviously as a financial person, I'd love to know the financial impact of that program if it's successful. And even more so, you had a lot of great ideas. I'd like to just get them all categorized and organized and, and involve them in our strategic planning discussions as the point I was trying to make. Right, okay. Thank you, okay, next, uh, John. Jim, I'm sorry, Jim Hopkins and then Joan. Yeah, John, um, I'm a member of the Finance Committee, as you know, and I've been kind of sitting on the sidelines acting as their financial conscience uh, as they go along. One of the things that I know they're doing, they've got this uh, consultant that is at the moment, just looking at the entire energy profile that we have, or at least we're getting information so that they can. Uh, from that perspective, we will look at all options, not just the options, the, the preferred options of various people on the committee, but what best suits our needs, given our financial status, as well as our energy needs, um, and, and categorizing and, and actually uh, prioritizing those needs. So I think it's still, very, very open, but be uh, uh, be aware that uh, I'm kind of acting as the financial conscience for that committee. Okay, thank you. I think, uh, oh, Joan, you me. wanted to Thanks, Jim. Yes, yes. I have a okay. quick question. If there's a consultant involved, what are we paying them? I think it's important that before the, you know, the committee has not been approved yet, we need to know what's going on. Maybe Jim can answer that question. The, the consultant has uh, decided that we'll do it for free with yeah. no, no obligations. Yeah, and that's you. quite common. They're going to do a feasibility study for free. And then if we don't, if we decide to do, not to do anything, there's obviously no cost. And, but if they present some options with costs, we'll evaluate that. Well, it's interesting that the committee is acting right now. We need to approve its actions or approve its going ahead. So thank you, guys. Okay, Lynn? I have one question regarding, now that I've read the mission statement. Um, could you tell, is, do, do we have a report of the current status quo and when what we have now without any changes will become obsolete and no longer functional, making the community at risk? Um, Lynn, there is, this is a new committee. I, I realize that, but I would, I'm wondering if has there been a study done of where we are today and then what this augmentation program will present to us for, for um, showing to the, to the residents how important it is where we are today and where we will be in the future. Has, has that been done? That's okay, Bert? Yeah, uh, I wrote a report a few months ago that went to the Disaster Planning Committee, uh, which pointed out the need to address resiliency and reliability of our energy, particularly with regard to their their needs, and that this is about the closest we've come. There, there's a, a history of the Energy Committee. There was an Energy Committee that was uh, with all aboard uh, uh, two or three years ago, okay, and they were addressing, and Bert can answer to that what they were addressing. They were addressing uh, the needs for the entire village, but it had a lot more to do with lighting and that sort of thing. Um, 
and um, and so this co this committee is is uh, more in tune to uh, to microgrid solar, you know, rather than just uh, lighting uh, that that we have addressed in the past. So does that answer your question? We've had no prior committee that actually addressed what they're going to address today. So um, I guess Bert would have the status quo of where we are today. And with regard to our, our um, public use uh, facilities, so that's all I was trying to see where we, where we are, because it would make so much sense to know the current status. So Bert, if you've got something like that, I'd love to see it. Could you pass it over to me? I'd appreciate it. Okie doke. I'll, I'll send you something. Okay. Thank you. Is there any I'd, other I'd, discussion? I'd just like yeah? to add. I'd like to add how many tens of thousands of pages would you like? So we got a lot of studies <laughs> that have been done. Yeah. We don't wow. want to inundate you. <laughs> I know. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Sue. All right. So um, all those in favor, okay, of um, of establishing, uh, of approving the formation of the Energy Solutions Ad, Ad Hoc Committee. All those in favor? Okay. And, is, and I'm, I'm looking in the, in to see John a yes. Okay, but we have, um, we have a majority that I can see. So the motion passes and congratulations because Bert will say to me, this is a long time coming, Bunny. <laughs> right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So uh, the next item on the agenda is to establish an advisory committee to review code of conduct and anti-harassment policy. So basically, uh, this group is just a, a preliminary group. It doesn't require staff to be there. Uh, we're just going to review review the documentation for those two items and then bring it to the board. Uh, it's just being able to prepare a draft uh, to present to our board. So it doesn't require staff. And, um, and I also, Joan has um, agreed that she would be chair and I would be on the committee and I need some volunteers. If there's anybody, okay, uh, Lynn would like to be on that. And okay, Joan, do you have a comment? Joan, okay, no, I, I move we I move we establish this committee. <laughs> okay, oh. we need a motion. All right, I I move that we establish uh, an advisory committee to review the code of conduct uh, with a maximum of five people, uh, including. Myself and Bunny and Lynn at this point, and we need two more folks to volunteer. And if you don't volunteer, we're going to assign you. Oh, Yvonne, good. And one more. How about Sue? <laughs> okay, but if Sue, you would do that, Sue. Okay, great. Okay. This is this is not gonna. We we should only have just you know, a few meetings. It won't be a long meeting. So, okay. All okay, right. So, we've got and a motion got before. before you take it to the floor, could I uh, ask that the um, review of the code of conduct and anti harassment is it applicable to the residential community or to the staff at VMS or wh who's it applying? Excuse me, we're talking about code of conduct, not harassment yet. Sorry, it's next. Well, anyway, the, the, code of, the code of conduct is for directors. It's for the board. Okay. In fact, if you, uh, you know, when you uh, become a new board member and probably um, before we get to new one, Grant will get to you and he will ask you to sign a code of conduct along with a confidentiality, you know, as far as being a new board member. So it's strictly for the board. And then uh, the anti-harassment, um, Lori has presented us a, a base agreement uh, that uh, her firm 
you know, has has uh, written for many of the HOAs. So we're going to review the documentation and that we do have a prior harassment policy. And once we are able to do that and the board approves it, then we have to start meeting with the rest of the boards as uh, as uh, James has suggested. And um, and that we will we will see if we can get uh, a conglomeration so that we have one harassment policy. Okay, okay we Any still have a motion on the floor. But wait, okay. could you could I make one more ask? Uh, yeah. Could the motion include review, uh, review code of conduct for board of directors? Be specific no. within it. Is it possible? No. I didn't hear what she said. What did you say? Review she what? The code. She wants to put harassment in with the code of conduct, and I don't think it's appropriate. No, 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 no. no I did not say that. One, one more time. I, I apologize. You misunderstood me. I'm saying, can we add to the motion that the advisory committee to? Uh, I'm sorry. That uh, the code of conduct is specifically to the board of directors, and not to anything else. Just specifically where. Right. Code of conduct applies. That's all I'm asking. That's a friendly, a friendly motion. Yes, of course. Uh, okay, code of conduct you. for for the GRF board. Okay, thank you. All right. So uh, we have a motion on the floor, and we have a second. Is there any more discussion? If there's no more discussion, all those in favor? Okay. I can see the motion passes, and thank you. All right, so um, my question is, does anybody need a break? If they don't, we will continue. So no one's hollering out there that we need a break, okay. Um, so uh, the next item is the report of the finance. So uh, Director Pearlstone. Thank you, President Carpenter. Can we get the slides that start on 14A, page one of 12 up there, and I'll walk us through our financial statements. These are through October 31st. While Grant is getting those slides up, I will simply share, this is gonna be another, I consider this very good news, uh, just a review just to show we're on track for our expectations with our reduced operations. Um, it's really a credit to staff that they're running efficiently and effectively to keep these numbers intact. There's a few things that we have to keep an eye on, but in general, they're gonna fall in line with what we expected. So with that in mind, this first page, um, first slide I should say, simply is the global overview showing our assessment and non-assessment revenue that totals up to 36 million. Um, we've had expenses through October 31st of 31732000 for a net revenue over expense of $4,271,000. So that's all operations, uh, reserves, capital expenses. That's kind of the big picture. On uh, the next slide, you can see it broken down by day-to-day -day operations. Um, so this gives you a, a snapshot of the things that are actually, you know, needing to be run day to day, whether it's resident services or what have you. So you can see the assessment revenue and non-assessment revenue associated with operations um, for the total revenue of 29618000 Total expenses are at 27330000 for an operating surplus of $2.288 our target for year end, December 31st, was just over 2 million. Um, I would read this that we're on track. This will probably not get larger because a lot of our expenses are booked in the last couple months of the year. Uh, I don't know how much that'll be applicable to operations, but just to be conservative, we'll take it as good news that we're on track. And if it ends up better, that that's great because those are funds that we need. Um, you know, obviously to, to manage, we did not have an assessment increase this year. They were applied to a very, very significant insurance increase and other expenses to keep that down. So we want to make sure we meet our surplus needs and that the residents can feel good about that because even though they didn't get access to as many services as they would like, at least the money is being conservatively managed and well used to keep costs down moving forward. So we can move on to slide three. And this is, I think, the first snapshot to kind of show where we are versus where we hope we'd be. And 
again, the breakdown starts with assessment and non-assessment revenue, where we are a little under budget on that, which we need to look into and verify that we don't have a lot of delinquencies or what have you. It's kind of more of a mutual issue than our issue, but still worthy of looking at. So uh, I don't know if uh, Jeff or if anyone on staff would have a comment on that today. We usually don't see a variance there, but that's in non-assessment revenue. My apologies. We do have a we do have an explanation for that, so I'll cover that in a later slide. Says more revenue is back on track. I take that as good news. We're not seeing a lot of delinquencies. So far, so good on that. Total revenue, $36 million versus a budget of $37,241. The entire difference is non-assessment revenue. We do have a slide that breaks that down where you'll see those differences. Um, our expenses are lower, which is what we hope they be. Um, it's not safe to assume that they would have been for sure. Who knew what kind of additional expenses we'd be facing with COVID. So again, I consider it a plus and another credit to staff that it was managed well. Um, I don't know who's not muted, but I heard a noise there. So if you're not muted, please mute. Um, and you can look at the bottom line and you can see the uh, net revenue over expenses. Uh, the actual we covered in that very first slide, which is 4.271 million. We thought we'd be at 2.26 million, so we have an excess over our budget of just over $2 million. Once again, right on track with our expectations. Hopefully there are no major surprises and we'll be close to that at year end because that was incorporated into next year's budget thought and planning. So, and I will be open to any questions anyone has at the end of this, but it is very similar to the prior three or four months report. So if they made sense, then just know that we're still seeing things flowing according to plan. Um, the next slide does walk through some of those budget variances. Um, I won't highlight too much here because there's a better slide that does the same thing with, uh, with well, no, this is probably the best one to do this. I take that back. So you can see that most of our variance is in employee compensation and related expenses, um, over $2 million uh, to, the, to the positive. Um, again, because of furloughs, because of things we could not provide, and you know, good adjustments by staff to manage costs for compensation and related expenses. Uh, we continue to do well on our investments. Uh, we have a significant gain for the year with a very, 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 very safe portfolio. We saw no downside in the market crash um, and we're constantly evaluating that, but so far so great with that program. And then you can see the other variances to the positive operating expenses, I'd say services, materials and supplies, and then taking a look at the orange on the slide, which shows where we're not up to budget, the highlights I would point to you that I think are very meaningful and things that our board can have influence on. Uh, trust facilities fees were well under what we anticipated, and you could blame that on COVID because you know real estate agents can't do as many home sales tours and we don't have as many uh, purchases. But that doesn't really fully explain the story. We have a significant slowdown in alterations and permits. And there are a number of homes, I was told as many as 140 in escrow. And each of those translates to a trust facility fee. So um, I've been in discussions with Third Mutual and United about trying to get with staff to find a way to break the log jam. And I know that the uh, slowdown with our computer system influenced it. But it's a high priority. That, that's the money we absolutely rely upon for our capital expenditures. So the board should be aware of that. And we hope staff will update us with the strategies we need to get those all up to speed. Um, clubhouse rentals, that's self-explanatory. We simply can't have them open. So we're well under budget there. And now I'll focus on insurance because we are facing, you know, there was a big increase last year. There's a bigger one this year. And um, we're dealing with it. And I'll comment after I'm done with the financial report on how we're at least starting to be proactive in dealing with the insurance crisis that's ongoing here in the community. And, and trust me, no one's lost sight of it. Um, moving on to the next slide. This is the one that comes back and breaks down the non-assessment revenues. And again, it doesn't specify which ones are under budget, but I think it's fairly, we covered it some of it on the prior slide. So trust facilities fees account for 26% of our total non-assessment revenue. They're well under budget. So now you remember that number from a couple slides ago that said we were under budget on some revenues. This gives you an idea of how it's split up. You know, broadband services is on target or even a little ahead on revenue, but we're down on golf, we're down on trust facilities fees. We're down on clubhouse rentals, miscellaneous revenues. 
you know, it's not so much that it's a crisis because it's just being offset by expenses we're not paying, but it's still something that we love to manage and, and get as much revenue as we can where it's appropriate, example being trust facilities fees that I mentioned. So I'll give you a second to look over that. You can just see how non-assessment revenues are split out. And we can then turn to very much in line with you know, every month we've reviewed this. Um, just gives you a feel that we're primarily a service operation, so our biggest expenses are employee compensation and related expenses. You can see how the others break down. Uh, the wedge of the pie chart to pay the most attention to. Well, I'd point to two for the benefit of our residents. Number one, insurance, professional, and legal. That is going up, and we're going to do all we can to manage it and bring it down or at least stabilize it. So that's important to know we're working on. And then cable program and franchise fees, that's been fairly stable, but that's going to be reviewed coming up in the coming months as well. So we're definitely proactively looking at anything we feel that there are room, you know, for significant improvement that will stabilize or even decrease costs and can benefit our residents without loss of service. So that gives you a feel for total expenses and how they break down. And then on pay, uh, slide seven, you'll see another important slide, which is showing our resale history of units sold. And as I pointed out, we are below the prior two years, but increasing rapidly in sales because the market's been very, you know, with interest rates as low as they are, people are buying in the community, they're being closed. We would just like them to be closed as fast as possible and, and get efficient again. But good news is sales are up and there's interest in, you know, moving into the community. So that's a good sign to see and we hope that keeps up. On to the next slide. Uh, this is pretty much just a summary of our capital expenditures to show you where the reserve funds are. And you can see it's broken down equipment, facilities, contingency, and then trust facilities fees. And you can simply read across and see where the ending balance is, how much of that is work in progress, projects currently going on, and then what's left over that hasn't been allocated to particular projects yet. Um, I, I find the next slide much more informative, but it's very related, so I don't mind skipping over this. Feel free to come back to it if you have a question on it. But this slide simply shows the same thing in a bar chart. So you can see that our reserve funds are as high as they've been over the last five years, showing good financial stability. You can see how they're split up between equipment, facilities, contingency, and the trust facilities fee fund. And so we're, we're kind of where we want to be on that. But again, we have a lot of projects coming. Um, we've got an insurance crisis to manage. I mentioned the projects. I should have been specific. We have clubhouses that are in review with performing arts center. So this fund is very important to make sure that we meet our objectives and, and grow it if at all possible. And so this year has been solid for that. On the next slide, we got one more to go here, don't I? Yeah, you can see a breakdown of what sort of things are going on in the fund balances, and you can kind of look for the highest numbers and see where most of the dollars are allocated, mostly clubhouses, and the funds is for about 4.8 million in total appropriations for clubhouses with 3.8 million unobligated. So you can see that we're, we're in a position where we've kind of been defensive, we've regrouped. Um, I think, you know, before I joined the board, the prior board did an excellent job of sheltering some funds to relook at as things stabilize. That was pre-COVID even, but just to try to get a good vision and uh, establish a strategic planning committee to help do that. So a lot of good moves to hopefully manage our finances in a, in a really positive way moving forward. So you can see those different uh, appropriations as you look down. We've made virtually no new appropriations for the last several months for obvious reasons, COVID and the fact that we're trying to, you know, get a strategic plan that makes sense for such appropriations. And that concludes the general financial report. There's not any, that's the last slide, right, Grant? It's the last one I have. Um, but I want to make a couple other comments I think are important that tie into the agenda anyway. And the, the primary one is that while there's not much we can be doing to really manage finances today versus our budget, except be conservative, um, 
you know, it's a credit to the board as a, in total. We've established an insurance committee that's meeting this week to aggressively begin to study what our options are for insurance, um, not just property insurance where we have been handed a multi-million dollar crisis, but all lines of insurance, understand where we have holes in coverage, you know, really do a good thorough review and hopefully get this managed and under control, uh, find the right consultants if consultants are needed, ask the right questions, get good answers, we hope. And that all begins this week. So that, that's a big step for progress that, you know, may not seem like much right now, but hopefully turns into significant dollar savings and stability and ideally better coverage um, in the foreseeable future, let's say the next 12 months if, if we have our way with it. Um, so go ahead and move into the other two reports, Bunny, because they're both mine, the strategic planning and the CAC. Okay. Uh, strategic, yeah, strategic planning. Um, I just kind of gave you the update for strategic planning because I feel strongly that there's not a lot to talk about in strategic planning until we stabilize what's going on with our existing finances. And we had our first meeting. All the boards have been asked to go and establish their priorities. I'm anxious and excited to get another meeting going and start to put together a, strat a global strategy that we can start to piece together so we have a vision for one year, five years, 10 years, 30 years. We need it. There's no question about it. But when there's fires burning in multiple directions, it doesn't make sense to you know go back and look at blueprints. We, we have to deal with some of the fires. So I'm hoping to see a meeting in December. That would be ideal. Um, but if not, it'll go into January. And it, it's being watched in the context of, quick example, I'm meeting with folks from Rossmore tomorrow to understand their strategic planning process and get some guidance on some pitfalls and proactive positive things we could do in our process. So we're doing some planning work on it. I just don't know how much we'll have to report for the next 30 to 60 days, but I'm anxious to bring that to, to the board. Um, with regard to the CAC committee, we did not have a meeting last month um, because things were running quite well. You know, we were in the red level looking to go to the orange level, as Jeff pointed out, all of a sudden things turned. And um, I've talked extensively, I see Brian's on this uh, meeting, Brian Gruner, the head of recreation, and we've talked extensively. The idea was to maintain as many things as the guidelines would allow for our residents, um, phase in new opportunities when possible, but because of the change, we felt that it was best to, you know, kind of just keep things going and watch them very closely. So I think things are going extremely well with almost every activity that's being offered, whether it's a fitness center, or some of the classes that are now being offered, pickleball, whatever. Um, they, they, they see everybody seems very pleased with them. I think they're well managed and they appear to be well supervised. Um, the only other thing I want to mention to the board that I don't know how many of you are aware of, I only recently became aware of it, is that there is a group of residents that is actively communicating with our staff. Um, they're called the Village Voices, at least that's my understanding of their name. And they bring a laundry list of questions, concerns, demands, requests, uh, you know, very proactive communication. What started out kind of in a protest format has actually turned far more civil and positive, in my opinion, in terms of wanting information and answers. Um, however, however, the board hasn't been included in this process at all, and that seems highly inappropriate to me. Um, and so since most of it had come through recreation, I did have a discussion with Brian, who I might understand is he's talked with Jeff, and they are keeping me in the loop at this point on different communications that are going on. And where appropriate, the board will get involved and try to, you know, keep our residents informed directly, as I guess I see our role is to be intermediaries. But I have no problem with any resident talking to our staff directly if they feel they, that that's the appropriate way to do it, through the appropriate means, of course, whether email or whatever. But I just wanted our board to be aware of it, because there's a lot of things that have gone on with that, and, and I wasn't aware of it, and I just think it's, that we should be aware of it. So, Probably a good time to ask Jeff if he wants to, to make any comments on that. Just about, you know, it, it seems to be in a good place now, but how we might move forward more in concert on that. Anything, Jeff? Um, my only comment is um, <clears throat> because that sometimes when the emails came from the Village Voices, it was uh, more like a demand letter. 
rather than an information letter. And um, and so um, I felt, uh, and I didn't say anything at all, but that was how I felt about it. And I did talk to staff, and they said they were handling it. And uh, and they were actually, you know, talking to some of those people. And I think that's really great. But, John, I think it's great if, um, you know, CAC uh, gets involved so that they can answer, you know, some of those questions. Um, the only uh, issue that I have is when they start, uh, you know, demanding uh, email lists. The emails of all of the, you know, whole village and things like that. Uh, I just think staff's better to handle that. Uh, well, well, my only comment, Bonnie, about it was I think staff has handled it well from everything I've seen and heard. I just simply uh, ask that we be provided information about any communication so we know what's being said and what the responses are, what's being promised or denied or whatever. So we can provide input to something that isn't consistent with what the board would want to do. Madam That's Chair. Fine. Yes, Madam John. Chair. Yes. Okay, uh, Eileen is very aware of it, and, and she is working with it. And it is a very small group, a very noisy group. And uh, while we're, we're paying attention to their, quote, demands, uh, I, I don't think it bears uh, re advertising them to the entire community because they don't speak for the entire community. Um, I'm telling you, it's going through communications and Jeff and Siobhan can verify that, but I think it's being handled. And I don't think it's appropriate to bring it forth. So my, my feedback on that issue is, I don't know how anyone on our board would know what is being said or done with these people because they weren't communicating to us what was being asked. Uh, they definitely handled some things in a very demanding and probably inappropriate way. And all I was saying is we would like to know what is being asked and we'd like to know what's being responded. And if we had any issues, we would then talk about it as a board. Certainly nothing wrong with us being aware it was really my only objective. But, and, and I will ask each one of you, but to me, uh, that is something that would be handled in um, closed session, okay, and, and and that Jeff and Siobhan uh, would report on it, you know, in closed session. But I agree with you, John. Um, we do need to hear, you know, we need we need to know what here was how many, you know, uh, letters we're getting, and and how we're handling it. So. Um, is there any more questions on any of this? Did did you want to ask a question, Lynn? And there was Joan. Okay. Uh, well, one on this particular topic you're just covering, which is the communication from this group. I, for some reason, got on their mailing list. So I've been getting some of the feedback uh, from them specifically, and I can forward that to the board when it comes to me. I just thought I'd pass that along. And the second, uh, issue to John. Hi, John. Pleasure to meet you. Hello, uh, Thank you. Uh, uh, back to the very first uh, um, report on the Finance Committee. Um, I'm wondering if we can get Jeff Parker to give us more information on the Alterations Committee because I'm, uh, I'm one of many affected by it, and I understand, um, uh, and I'm also working with the City of uh, Laguna Woods um, building permits because I'm getting some work done on my place. They have, uh, the feedback from the alterations, Jeff, has been horrendous for those of us. And they have over 300 uh, requests. That means, like, if they're each permit from the uh, community was $285, for instance, you know, we're missing out on, like, $85,000 that we're not getting through. Point because... of order, Madam Chair. Okay. Uh, Joan? Yes, Joan? My point of order is we need to stick to the topic which is simply a report from John. We don't comment right now. It's appropriate to ask him, but I, I'm concerned that we get into a discussion we don't need to right now. Uh, I'll, add on, sure to what Joan, that I'll no? add on to what Joan just said. It, it's, we do have a financial interest in alterations, but it's more of a mutual issue. Um, 
So probably something we can figure out how to get feedback to them and find and maybe get a meeting or something like that. It doesn't need to be discussed through our board. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Is there any more questions? <clears throat> so let's move forward. Let me, let me, uh, Bunny, yeah. uh, let me Bunny, I just want to add that we are going to meet in December. Um, I'm trying to see if that date's on it for the community activity committee. Uh, the date is not posted, but I will find it and put it in the chat box. So definitely welcome to attend this public meeting. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, the next item is the uh, equestrian center and uh, the the uh, committee met October 22nd and the next meeting is scheduled for December 3rd at uh, 1 p.m. And uh, at this meeting, we'll be talking about new services that may be offered and safety issues and basically will be an update of uh, of the program said that we are uh, trying to get open and and approved uh, before uh, the question center is um, can open and uh, believe me I'm looking forward to when we can open that equestrian center <laughs> so not not that I have a horse over there but it's um, it's a really pleasant place uh, to go over there and uh, just hang out Okay, um, so the next item would be uh, the report on landscape, and that would be uh, Yvonne. I'm here. Well, we had our meeting yesterday, and uh, one of the things that we discussed was the creek, and uh, today, as a matter of fact, they're starting the removal of the weeds and the cattails along the creek, which will make a lot of people happy. And also, uh, we approved and uh, the recommendation of the landscape department to remove five trees. They're all volunteer trees. And in the long run, it's gonna save us money, but the cost is gonna be about $1,700. And this, this um, will become, this will come before the board at our next meeting. For approval from uh, GRF to remove these trees and get the funding. Um, also, uh, our next meeting is February 10th. And that's about all we talked about. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Yvonne. Uh, the next report will be from uh, Maintenance and Construction, uh, EGOT. Okay, um, so we met on uh, November 13th and we discussed uh, four options and we're going to, uh, I mean, four items to uh, carry out at the uh, pack. And they are <clears throat> the LED lighting throughout the entire building. We're gonna renovate the dining room and uh, the foyer. And then we're going to uh, fireproof and clean stage curtains and finally the big item about half a million dollars is the replacement of the HVAC and upgrade of, of that uh, unit and we're going to uh, propose that uh, these items for acceptance to the board by the board uh, in the closed meeting our next meeting will be December 9th and we're gearing up for what we're going to be discussing at that one as we speak. Thank you. Oh. Thank you. Okay, uh, Bert, do you have a um, report, uh, <coughs> excuse me, on Clubhouse One? Uh, I do not have, we did not meet. I'm waiting for staff to bring back to me uh, the list of architects that are interested in doing the programmatic study and we will be arranging to interview these uh, architects uh, at some time in the near future, hopefully. Um, I suspect that with the holidays coming up that this is probably not going to take place until sometime in January. That's all I have to report. All right, thank you. Um, the next report would be the media and communications, uh, Joe. 
Okay, we did not meet in uh, November. Our next meeting will be December 14th at 1.30, uh, where we'll be talking about the broadband group, which is doing research on our cable, and uh, we'll, some strategies for uh, getting in touch with residents more who don't know all the facts. <laughs> come, come and see. Um, and that's about it at this point. So that's the end of my report. December 14th, 1.30. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, next item would be a Mobility and Vehicles Committee, uh, Don Tibbet. He hasn't turned on, um, there we go. Oops, <laughs> turn it back on. <laughs> there we go. Am I on now? Yes, you are. Oh, great. Speak up, though. Sorry. Uh, we had a meeting scheduled for tomorrow, but it's been canceled. Chris called me and said he's still having some problems with the Internet connections and was hard to get on board. Um, there are no major problems or concerns since our last meeting, and uh, I would like to thank you for passing earlier today at our meeting the uh, – uh, destination fee of $10. That's going to be a tremendous help. Our next meeting is scheduled for February 3rd at 1.30. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next item would be security and communications, and that's uh, Don Tibbetts also. Okay, our meeting is scheduled for December 28th at 1.30. At this time, I have nothing to report. Okay, thank you. Um, traffic hearings. Director Horton. You. Um, our last meeting was October 21st, which wasn't much of a meeting because only one person showed up. Uh, and our next meeting is scheduled for um, December 16th. The November meeting was canceled. Hopefully, this December meeting won't be. Um, but that's all the information that I have right now. Thank you. Thank you. Um, disaster preparedness, uh, Director Maldo. Um, the Disaster Planning Task Force met, uh, and we went through the reports. Things are pretty much uh, on schedule. Um, we're investigating energy, of course, in terms of availability of energy. And um, there are some problems with regard to uh, people getting updated or let's say charged batteries, um, one in particular uh, that's being looked into. We're short one person uh, with regard to uh, our contacts. Um, but other than that, things pretty much look pretty good in, in terms of uh, overall um, status. Um, but that's all I have to report. Okay, thank you. So the, the next item is the GRF bylaw committee. Um, the committee uh, presented their final um, draft and they're ready for uh, our board you know, to set up a to set up a meeting so that they can vote on it. Um, I have um, concerns for one item, and so I'm sent that to Lori, and she will be ready to comment on that at our closed meeting. So as soon as we can get that worked out, um, we'll be uh, setting up a meeting, uh, an all boards meeting, and. Um, and get it approved. So the next item would be the software research group, and uh, that is Jim Hopkins. Thanks, Director. Um, we started um, some while ago before I became a director here, and the uh, ad hoc committee is chaired by um, Andre Torf, director in United, and they've done a, a lot of work prior to me coming on board. Um, the purpose I understand was to produce a white paper 
that would uh, understand our needs and recommend some solutions uh, for those needs. Uh, it came out of an understanding that the current architecture and platforms of the current software uh, were perhaps antiquated and wouldn't fit to our future needs. So the purpose, what we, did, what we did was to identify all of the functions, and there's some 30, 40, 50 functions within the community that we use. Uh, we also identified several software packages that contain most of those functions. And so we narrowed it down to maybe three to six software packages. None of the packages cover all of our needs, so there's still some work to be done. Uh, once we did that, we wanted to get all of the stakeholders involved. Uh, the stakeholder would be the staff heads of those particular functions, for instance, fleet maintenance, transportation, finance, grounds maintenance, all of those people would be stakeholders because we needed to understand what they require in the software or how they're using the software today. Uh, currently, we are looking at how best to engage those stakeholders without um, uh, a lot of their time so that we would have a clear understanding of what the requirements are. And so we're looking at those, a couple of methodologies right now, and that will be discussed at our next meeting. So that's kind of where we stand, but uh, we're moving along, but I think we're a little bit behind because we've done a lot of work studying uh, what our requirements are. We now have to engage the staff. And that's my report. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a question. And um, is the intent with all this study for this uh, software system, is the intent, intent to replace Stellar and the AX system? Or is the intent to um, uh, just to complement those two systems? Well, my understanding, and, and, and maybe Chuck, when, when he comes on, can give a better understanding of this. But my understanding is the platforms and architecture of these systems um, may or may not exist in the near future. They're just not being supported in the way that we need to be supported. Uh, so the, the, I guess the easy answer to your question is yes, we're looking at all the requirements and Stellar and uh, the other uh, solutions are, are essentially up for grabs if we can find a better solution that fits all of our needs. And one of the complications is you know, all the off-the-shelf HOA systems. I mean, we are an HOA, but we are a unique HOA, as we know. And uh, uh, most of the HOA systems, when you dig down underneath them, may or may not be appropriate for all of our needs or deal with the needs as we deal with them today. So it is, uh, uh, we're, we're looking at all of those things. I hope that answers your question, Bunny. No, it does. And I know it would very be very difficult to replace Stellar. <laughs> I mean, it's old and it's been patched up for a long time. Right. Right. <laughs> okay. Well, just so the intent is to not to lose anything by any sort of conversion, but to, but to gain. Right. Right. Okay. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Um, the next item is future agenda items. Um, all matters listed below are items of future board meetings. Uh, no action will be taken by the board on this agenda item at this meeting, and the board will take no action on the items at a future. Uh, and the board will take action on these items in a future board meeting. So, and uh, the future. Agenda item is the resolution and distribution of telephone directories and community maps. Um, is there anything that we want to add uh, to future agenda? Okay, so we'll go forward uh, at this point in time. Director comments. Um, and, and you can all speak, or if whoever wants to speak, raise their hand and I'll recognize you. Okay, Yvonne. Oh, um, well, I wanna thank uh, Andre Tulin 
for um, helping us out on the um, ad hoc committee on the equestrian center. And he has left that post, but I do appreciate all of the pictures and uh, videos that he took over there that uh, we are using on channel six. That's all I wanted to say. Bye. Thank you. Is there anyone else that wants to make a comment? Okay, James, James? Oh, well, yes, actually, I forgot to mention that I, I obligate, I wanted to ask a GRF board what you expect the VMS board to do to help you. You know, so far we've been working independently, but since I'm your representative, I we like to know if you want to make a request, expect us to do something to help you. Please let us know. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> my comment, uh, Stephanie wrote me an email uh, last night or the night before, <clears throat> and she basically would like to have uh, the VMS rep and the board meet. So uh, that's what I suggested. She wanted to meet with me, but I wanted to have it for the full board, maybe, uh, you know, at our next, uh, agenda prep meeting and have a discussion time so that we can all get together and give suggestions to um, uh, the VMS board members as to what kind of things we would like to hear from them um, and basically give them a format. Uh, uh, we, 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 I think we could probably do better myself. I can do better as being able to communicate with them and um, so that so that we work more as a team rather than separate. So um, I, w I will bring it up in closed meeting to see if we could uh, go ahead and set up some kind of meeting. Um, possibly I'm hoping uh, maybe at our next uh, agenda prep meeting at the end, you know, that we could all talk about it. So, okay. okay. Um, uh, Lynn? Okay, so I'm, I'm behaving. Joan, correct me if I'm wrong, but can I at this point uh, ask whether or not we could put on future um, uh, agenda item a survey instrument that we would um, generate that would give us the information and feedback on not only our communications um, uh, within the community itself and what they need and what their opinion is of our current situation, but um, uh, any other items that the board feels are would be interesting to know what the residents feel uh, is necessary. And that particular item would include both, in my mind, um, focus groups as well as a communication uh, survey instrument. Okay, so, Joan. Joan. That I think that I'm probably going to come up in media and communications this next meeting, and it, that's where it will come up. They, they, they've been working on a, a a general approval survey or disapproval survey for the village for some time, and we have we are working with a professional surveyor, if you wish, a professor from the college who is here. So we're designing it. They're in the process of designing the survey now. You hear more about it hopefully at our media and communications meetings, and then it will come up to the boards after we get it set. Okay. Are there any other comments? Everybody's getting hungry. Okay. Um, it's 11:34. So how about if we meet? Uh, we recess and then um, resume at uh, 12 o'clock for our closed meeting. All right, we'll see you at 12 o'clock and thank you. Thank you everybody. Mm -hmm.